Broadcasting from the center of the military universe, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. This is the 18th Airborne Corps Podcast, the official podcast of America's Contingency Corps. Hey, this is Joe Buccino, host of the 18th Airborne Corps Podcast. This is day five, day five of nine days, a nine-day series on Operation Market Garden. Every day up until Saturday, September 25th, a new episode on Market Garden. And this is the fifth in that series. This is episode 67 of the podcast. This is In Defense of Monty. And, you know, people have very strong opinions about Montgomery, Bernard Law Montgomery, British Field Marshal from World War II. We've talked about him here. We had Dr. John Bonin on. We've given, I guess, an American view, obviously an American view of Montgomery. And so now we're bringing in a Brit. And that Brit is James Learmont. He's a retired general. He's led airborne forces. He actually served as the deputy commander of the 82nd Airborne Division from 2015 to 2017. So a British officer who for two years was in the American 82nd Airborne Division, one of the units that was under British command in Operation Market Garden. And one interesting perspective purview on this is that James's father is the patron of the Glider Pilot Regiment, and that really is a big deal. His father was an actual pilot, and the Glider Pilot Regiment was the pilots who flew the gliders in the European theater in World War II. And his father's a big figure in the British Airborne and the British Army. And his father met Montgomery, so we talked about that. We talked about his opinions on this subject, on Montgomery, the British purview. And one thing that you find when you start talking about Montgomery and Market Garden is that there's a lot of people, a lot of older Brits and a lot of older Americans who have really deeply felt, deeply considered opinions about Montgomery and about Gavin, the American general who's commanding the 82nd, and about Mark Garden in general. I, you know, I don't think people today walk around focused on this or upset or concerned about the way these things are portrayed, but there is a generation of people in the United States, in the British history community, and in the British military who hold strong opinions about this. And so I think General James Learmont, retired general, offers a perspective that's, I think, really important here. And he talks about that. Now, one thing we should mention here, it's not going to make much sense if you don't know this, or part of it won't make much sense if you don't know that, is during World War II, you know, first of all, Montgomery had a lot of successes during World War II. And so he's one of the most prominent, successful British commanders of that war, of, I guess, modern British history. He notably commanded the Allies against Erwin Rommel in North Africa and in the invasions of Italy and Normandy. So Market Garden was just one component of that. When Britain declared war on Germany in 1939, Montgomery was sent to France with the British Expeditionary Force, and he commanded their 3rd Division. And he trained, he predicted the operation would be a disaster, he trained for a tactical retreat, and that proved vital during the Dunkirk evacuation in 1940. And we talk about here, or General Learmont, I don't really talk about General Learmont, James Learmont, talks a little bit about El Alamein. And that was a big success. That was a big moment emotionally and culturally for the British military and in World War II, tactically and operationally. And so in 1942, Winston Churchill appointed Montgomery commander of the 8th Army in the Western Desert. And Montgomery rapidly restored that army. There was, you know, morale was waning. The men were not properly supplied. They were really at a disadvantage. And for nearly two months, he just trained. He re-equipped his soldiers. He bolstered their morale like any good leader would. And he effectively organized this, the defense of El Alamein against the German forces. He countered Italian attacks, German attacks, and then delivered the Allies their first major land victory of the war at the Second Battle of El Alamein in October 1942. It was a turning point in the North African campaign. And in some ways, it was a turning point in the Second World War. So we talked about that. That's a big moment. Now, Montgomery also played a crucial role in Sicily, then Salerno in Italy in 1943. And this is in spite of disagreements he had with both Patton and Bradley. Some people who are supporters of Patton will say, well, Montgomery 
was jealous of Patton's prominence and his exposure in the media. And then people who support Montgomery will say, no, Patton was jealous of Montgomery's success at El Alamein. Either way, it's all important to consider. And it's all a matter of perspective, and it's all a matter of historical perspective, which is what we're doing here in the show. Okay, that's enough intro. This is my discussion on Montgomery with James Learmark. And it's a big question opening up here, but... How should we think about Montgomery's legacy? Not just Market Garden, obviously Market Garden's part of it, but broader, you know, his entire legacy as a leader, as a Brit, as somebody who led the Allies through World War II. How should we be thinking about him? Thanks, Joe. It's a broad question, and I am no acknowledged expert on Montgomery, but I think you have to go back just a little bit before the war even to perhaps get a perspective on it. You know, Montgomery was very active in British experimentation in armoured warfare. He was a tank regiment officer. Mm. And he'd been very fundamental in, in trying to look at some of the experimental work we did in the early 30s. You know, you've know, you got to understand the timing of this. The Nazis in Germany, 1933 onwards, you know, so they were experimenting with armoured warfare after 33. The British had an experimental brigade before that. But as with everything, particularly, you know, with Empire really stifled those initiatives. And, you know, so the money was fed back into you know, what, what is best described as colonial policing. But Montgomery was one of the sort of leading lights of that. And I think, you know, he had developed his own ideas on how to do armoured warfare, uh, and probably more importantly, you know, how to counter armoured warfare. And so, you know, he had this developing knowledge, and he was not massively trusted by the British High Command. I mean, I think we all know his temperament was somewhat awkward. But, you know, as you drift in, into the Second World War and you watch the Allied effort from sort of 1939 through to about 1942, you can't look at that period and sort of put your hand on your hand and say there were a lot of successes. In fact, there were no successes. Mm -hmm. And a succession of military commanders had come and in a number of theatres, whether it was northern France with the Blitzkrieg or whether it was in Africa, they'd been systematically defeated by this aggressive form of armoured warfare. Mm -hmm. So here you suddenly get an opportunity falls into the lap of Montgomery, where he was the only person that seemed to have a winning formula for dealing with this. And, and you know, he's given the command in North Africa, and he played his cards well. He had shortened lines of supply, interior lines. He allowed himself to build up overwhelming force, time when the Germans under Rommel were clearly losing Team, you know, and at the Battle of Alamein, he actually achieved quite a comprehensive victory over the Nazi force. You know, in the context of the British psyche, it's the first success the Commonwealth forces have felt, you know, since the war started. I'm also sort of talking about the efforts in the Far East, you know, where the Japanese were on the doorsteps of India. So, you know, within the context of the British war effort, this was it, the first tangible strike back. 1942. And so from a British psyche, he's elevated onto a pedestal. And it's hard to sort of knock somebody off a pedestal that's suddenly become a national hero. And so working through his systematic efforts in North Africa, we have the shift of theatres across into Italy. When they're looking at the second front, as it were, in, in coming in through northern France, from a British perspective, he is the obvious choice, just in terms of his track record. But his track record and his ability to utilize armored warfare to defeat a comparable force. So I think you've got to look at it in that context. He was seen as a national treasure. He had done some fantastic work. Yes, he may not have been as glamorous as the likes of General Patton. He may not have been quite as forthright as that. But he had achieved results, and he had achieved results with limited resources. The depth of the British war machine was not extensive. I mean, you couldn't just keep relying on millions and millions of people being mobilized. I mean, the British military were quite depleted, and so he had a dwindling resource to operate with. And so he was cautious in how he expended those treasures. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to look at it in that context. You know, so come 1944, the obvious person to lead the sort of the landings in Normandy. And then once we get over into the northern theatre between him and Patton, working to Eisenhower, you had a guy who had had success, believed in himself. In fact, one might argue believed in himself just a little bit too much, possibly mm -hmm. to the detriment of the wider war effort, right. but had a proven track record. 
And how do you fall out in terms of the decision to launch Operation Market Garden? Now, obviously, Eisenhower approved Market Garden. I think people forget about that a little bit. But the planning was all Montgomery's idea, his imagination. How do you evaluate that? Again, I look at it through the lens of the time. I mean, the initial landings in and around Normandy it had taken quite a long time to get the beachhead. It had taken quite a long time to build up the forces. It had taken a long time to press the Germans back. And to break out of that Normandy bulge had taken longer than we perhaps thought. But at the point that it happened, what then occurred was unbelievable success. I don't think anyone predicted suddenly the rapid move down to Paris and then to the sort of the Belgian borders. I mean, it happened very quickly to the point where the Allied effort was outrunning its ability to resupply and sustain its own troops. That, I think, is a fact of life. And so what you've got now, with their inability to develop a second deep-sea port, they were looking to Ostend and places like that to do it, but they were still bringing everything in through the sort of the Cherbourg area and through the beachhead of Normandy. That's where all the supplies were coming. So I think both army commanders, and clearly Eisenhower, they did not have the resources to sustain two fronts at the same time. There had to be a main effort where the weight of effort was going to go. And the decision, obviously, was does it go with Montgomery or does it go with Patton? And, of course, I think Montgomery knew this, and I think he knew full well, you know, in his own mind, that he wanted to be the guy that unpicked the access into Germany. He wanted to be the person that pushed on. He felt, I think, that the Allied, as in the Commonwealth effort, deserved the right to do it because they'd been fighting since 1939. Mm. And I think he was looking to have a way of doing it. And I think whether it's intelligence, failures, or it doesn't matter what you want to call it, he came up with an ambitious plan, which, had it worked, we've all been talking in this conversation differently. Mm -hmm. The reality is it was, one could argue, let's say 75% successful. But unfortunately, it's that last 25% that the key part in this. And so he came up with this plan and to implement it, allowed the Germans enough time to perhaps regain the initiative, or at least to regain enough initiative to hold the line against the airborne forces. You know, I think it was a bold plan, but perhaps just a little bit too bold. But I think it was driven by a desire, a genuine desire to be the one that unlocked the way into Germany. Your father, he was an honorary captain, I think, of the Glider Pilot Regiment, which was, of course, the British Airborne Forces in the Second World War, the responsible for flying, crewing the military gliders in the European theater. And he met Montgomery. I don't think he served under Montgomery, but he met him uh, late in Montgomery's life, late in, after he'd already left military service. Is that right, sir? It is true, actually. My father was and still is the patron of the glider pilot. He's the sort of the, the honorary figure at the head of the glider pilots. There are very, very few glider pilots left. You know, most of them are in their 90s or 100s, you know, mm -hmm. so there are very few left. And, you know, that's the reason why he is determined he will continue with that role up until the point where he dies, because, you know, <laughs> he's probably the youngest of the lot. I mean, he's 87. So, yes, he is still very active with the glider pilots. And, yes, my father went to the staff college when we had such luminaries as Earl Mountbatten, Viscount Slim of Burma, and Montgomery. All of them were speakers at the staff college when my father was there. And so he listened to all of those people of interest. You know, actually, Mountbatten was the one he rated as the best speaker and certainly the most credible. But, you know, there was still an aura, even at his time in life, when the likes of Phil Marshall Montgomery did speak. And he was not a great public speaker, mm -hmm. but you just had to take note and listen because of what he'd achieved. And I think that was something that, for me, it's an interesting link to history. You know, we're talking about a guy that my father actually had heard speaking at the War College when he was going through. Mm. What year was that? So I'm guessing that would have been the early 60s. My father joined the army sort of 1952, so in the fullness of time, I'm guessing 62, 64, that sort of period. So we're talking 10, 15 years after the culmination of the war, but at that stage, Montgomery was still an icon. Yeah. We'll close out this discussion with this question. What about now? How do British officers and the community and the military view Montgomery now? You know, the name still conjures up memories of Al Alamein. If you say the word Montgomery, you don't think of Market Garden. You may think of Normandy, but most people will just immediately go to Alamein, you know, and, mm -hmm. and because I think it was such a defining moment. So I think people will look at him in that optic, but 
A lot has been written about him, and a lot of research has been done, and you know, lots of counterpoints of view have been brought across. And I think there is a revisionist history of him, not so much in terms of his military achievements, but certainly in terms of his interaction with subordinates, peers, uh, and in particular with our multinational partners. You know, And the relationship he had with Patton was not good. And one could argue that he was, again, a very prickly character with Eisenhower, who, of course, as we all know, had the most difficult job in the world at the time, You know, trying to stitch together this alliance of countries in common cause. And so I think there is this sort of revisionist thing that, you know, Montgomery did not play a particularly good hand in terms of this multinational element and that he was an arrogant person, very firm in his belief in his abilities, perhaps to the detriment of the bigger picture. And I think that's the strategic take from this is no matter how good you think you are, you need to understand the strategic picture a little bit more. And sometimes you have to sort of take deference to common cause. And if that means that you're not the primary point of contact, well, you've just got to support. And I think that's the sort of revisionist part of him in his latter service, that he didn't play a very good partner in the international effort. Mm. All right, sir. Well, look, we thank you for your insight there and perspective on Montgomery and a lot of wisdom there. Just thank you so much. Really, a way we don't think about him in the United States, at least not in the American Army. And I really want to thank you for that insight, sir. Hey, Joe. Well, pleasure as always. You know me. I'm always happy to help out with the 18th Air Bon Corps. Yes, sir. Always. Thank you so much, sir. Take care. Have a great week. Everyone, all the way. Everyone, all the way. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye. Okay, that was my discussion with James Learmont, and, you know, really thoughtful there. A lot to consider from him, from the British perspective, and a lot of this thinking about Montgomery is tied up in what he represented in the war, what he represented to the British people and to the British officers. So, glad we caught back up with him. He's a great guy, as you heard, and as you could probably tell in his voice, you could feel his heart, and he really does hold the airborne forces in very high regard. It's very important to him and his father. And Montgomery is very important to his father. So we want to thank you for continuing to listen to this series. This is the sixth of a total of nine daily episodes on Operation Market Garden. Another one tomorrow. We ask you to subscribe. You can listen to this on Stitcher. You could subscribe on Apple Podcasts. You could subscribe on Podbean. And you could subscribe also on Spotify. Leave a five-star rating, please, and a review. It helps other people find the show. And thanks for continuing to listen to the show, and hopefully you'll listen to tomorrow's show. I am host Joe Pacino. This is the 18th Airborne Corps podcast, and thank you so much for listening. Mm-hmm.